Hi everyone, thanks for having me. Super excited to be here today. And today I'm going to talk to you about the journey that we've made over the past couple of years with our architecture from hand built artisanal servers to a mass produced clone army. Now, during this talk, I'm going to talk about how our build tools have had to evolve and level up to enable us to achieve that scale and how we've had to adapt our configuration management. But let's start with a definition first. What actually is immutable infrastructure? Now, I've seen a lot of definitions over the past couple of years, but I quite like this one by Florian Motlick, who's the CTO of Codeship. And he states, immutable infrastructure is comprised of immutable components that are replaced for every deployment rather than being updated in place. Now, I'd further qualify that by saying your components are typically data and everything else. And it is everything else components that you really want to focus on and, and, and update rather than doing it in place. Now, immutable infrastructure is a very powerful pattern. The idea that you can create, update, and destroy servers on a whim without service interruptions is, is awesome. That is the dream that we all aim for. But the problem with this is that it's difficult to achieve without having the right tooling in place to enable you to do that. Now, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the history of the company because it gives you a lot of context into some of the design decisions that we had to make. Now, back in 2012, we were actually called Zbox, and we were a smart TV remote and uh, focused on ingesting lots of EPG data. Uh, we then pivoted to introduce social networking features, and we then rebranded in early 2014 to become Beamly. We then pivoted again to become a content network, and then another pivot to become an ad tech business. And we were eventually acquired last October by a company called Coty. But it's during these awkward social network teenage years that I want to focus on, because they had the biggest impact on our architecture. Now, as a social network for TV, discussions were primarily based around the TV shows themselves. And some of those TV shows had live components. So sometimes they would do on-air calls to action, which would look something like this. The battle start right now. It's your chance to pick who you think will win. Oh my God. Play and interact with other fans on the Boys Play Along game in the free Zbox app or at zbox.com now. Whoa! Now, as a fledgling social networking startup, this is exactly the kind of stuff that we needed, right? Send us all your users. But there's a problem. And the problem here is that the networks behind these TV shows often didn't give us a heads up when they were going to do this. So the call to action might be this week, might be next week. We just didn't know. And quite often, the engineering teams were the last people to find out hours before, or often not even find out at all. So typically, what would happen when these calls to action went out is we would get woken up by the creepy, robotic stalker voice of PagerDuty. So the engineering team would rally at 3 AM in the morning fighting hard and fast to try and add its capacity as quickly as possible. But it was a losing battle. And by the time service was restored, the damage was already done. Users took to Twitter and Facebook to vent their angers that they couldn't talk with the TV show and the TV stars that they wanted to interact with. And the following morning, we'd get a call from the network with the stone-faced stone executives complaining can you deal with all the users we're sending you away? This is, this is reputational damage for our brand, for our show. What, what can you do to alleviate these problems? So we needed a better way to scale up and meet this demand. And we needed it to be as autonomous as possible. And given that we were hosted on Amazon, we decided to look at auto-scaling. Now, typically, there's a lot of different ways you can use autoscaling, but typically they fall into really one of two approaches. And in the first approach, the idea is 
you essentially configure the instance when it comes up. So the first thing that happens when an instance boots up is it pulls down its configuration from an S3 bucket. In this case, we pull down an Ansible playbook. And it then runs that on itself to provision its code and all of its requirements. And then when the load balancer deems it worthy of serving traffic, it, it's, it's up and running. Now, this approach works. But the problem, and the problem that we had with this, is the ramp up time. Provisioning, depending on the complexity of the component that you're putting out there, uh, it could take 20 minutes, could, could be even longer. And we just didn't have that because we had very short, sharp scalability requirements. So in the second approach, the idea is to front load all of that effort and actually build it into the image itself. So the Ansible playbook, in this case, runs when bundling the image. So then when we launch instances of that image, they come up very quickly and are ready to serve traffic in a matter of seconds as opposed to minutes. And this is ultimately the approach that we took. But we needed a way to build this in an automated way. So we had to come up with a build pipeline, which looks something like this. So uh, in this case, you take the source code, uh, compile an artifact. So most of our backend components were written in Scala. So the output there would be a jar. Uh, and then provision the image, install all of its dependencies and the jar itself. And then snapshot that image and eventually test that image and deploy it. Now, the key point to take away here is we test the image before we deploy, regardless of whether it's a stage deploy or a live deploy, because we need assertion that that image was built correctly. And in practice, this build pipeline looks like this. So we use ThoughtWorks Go as our continuous delivery tool of choice. And it's the one that we found that closest aligns with the continuous delivery book by Jez Humble and David Farley. If you haven't read that book, I, I strongly suggest you do. And I can't stand here and say it's a perfect build tool because it, it's far from it. But it lets us get to where we want to be. And we've been using it for nearly five years at Beamly now. So if you look at that screenshot, you can see the actual Git materials and the commits that are fed into upstream pipelines. And then we have build pipelines that are brought in at build time to bake the image and then eventually deploy and to test live. But the thing to take away there is consistent versioning across the entire stream of the pipeline. And it is what you need in order to achieve traceability, which I'll come back to. Now, build tools are quite often the unsung heroes of most platform teams and most engineering teams. When they work, and they work well, everybody typically ignores them. But it's like your water supply in your house. When it stops working, when you have a burst water pipe, or when your hot water supply stops, that's when you really notice. So at Beamly, we've iterated quite a lot with our build tools over the past few years, the most recent iteration of which we call Gears internally. And what it essentially is is a collection of Python scripts and a Python modules, which allow us to act as a glue layer between our architecture and our build tools, our build pipelines. And they're really broken down into three areas. So AMI Bake is responsible for looking up various bits of metadata from our architecture. And then it uses that to actually generate a packer template and then execute the packer build. Uh, AMI Deploy, uh, we have some legacy components that still get deployed using Asgard. Uh, for newer components, it actually executes an Ansible playbook to deploy that AMI. And then we also have AMI Test. It's very simple. It spins up an instance of an image and then runs smoke tests against that. Now, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about automated testing. Because quite often, there's a lot of focus on software testing and TDD principles when it comes to writing the software, but not so much when it comes to testing your architecture and testing your deployment flow. One of the things that we decided very early on at Beamly was that we needed to have a standardized set of endpoints. Um, we, as we very quickly grew our architecture to over 80 different backend components, we needed to have a standardized way to interact with them. So we decided that every single service has to implement a standard set of endpoints. And each of those endpoints, regardless of what language the component is written in, has to have a consistent standard output. So if you expect JSON with certain keys, it has to be there 
And it makes it very easy for us to reason about and test services, whether we've had experience with them for years or whether they were only deployed a couple of days ago. And this spec is actually open source at beamly.github.com slash beamly slash se4. So that spec actually gives you a complete set of all the endpoints that we use, as well as the, all the, the metadata and the data types that you expect back from those endpoints. So we have simple endpoints like the service config, which just returns a JSON representation of the configuration, and simple ones like GTG, which simply returns 200 if a service is, thinks it's OK and ready to go, or a 500 if it's not. So as I said, take a look at that, and feel free to add some comments or send a pull request if you think it needs more work. Uh, I think this spec has actually been used by the Connected Digital Homes team, the Hive team at British Gas. And I believe there's actually an open source implementation of it in Go. And the other tool we use is Smolder. And it's actually an uh, iteration of an internal tool that we wrote, which a colleague of ours then refactored and made open source. And it's a pretty simple tool. It's, it's a REST API testing tool. So let's take a look at how it works. So you write your tests in either JSON or YAML. So in this case, we're hitting a endpoint service status. And we're setting a couple of headers on that input. And we're making a couple of assertions of the output. We're expecting the string foobar stage to be in the output. And we're expecting the status code to be 200. So when you take that test file and give it to Smolder along with a host name, the output looks something like that. Now, it's very simple. And it's very quick and easy to run. But I have to stress that this is not designed to replace more exhaustive functional testing, something that you might use RunScope for, for example. The reason for us using it is that we can rely on automated testing to push this out very quickly and push it out to stage with a reasonable level of confidence that that image was built correctly. And of course, that brings me on to Packer. When we first started designing our new architecture, Packer wasn't actually around as a project. So we actually started building our own version of Packer internally, which we called Doughboy, named after the Pillsbury Doughboy. Um, but it was an ill-fated project. Uh, the approach that we took was to actually spin up an instance and then run provisioning code against that instance and then stop it and snapshot it. Logically, that seems to make sense, but the problem there is this is the cloud, right? Everything's a promise. There's a lot of broken promises in the cloud. Um, so we had a lot of inconsistency when it came to the network I.O. So the build time could vary wildly between 20 minutes to an hour and a half. It was ridiculous. And because of this inconsistency, we couldn't confidently recommend it to the rest of the engineering teams. So when we saw Packer, and it was announced at version 0.3, I think, uh, we saw it had a ch root based builder. Uh, we got super excited. So I'm going to have a quick overview of how it works and how a template is made up. So Packer works by you passing in a, essentially a bunch of JSON. And that JSON can contain one or more builders. Now, the builders are responsible for actually building your images. So it can take a definition for building an Amazon image, a Google image, even, even the Docker container. So in this case, we're defining a builder to use the CH root builder to build us a HVM AMI. And the template can also contain one or more provisioners. And the provisioners are what are responsible for out actually bundling all of the dependencies onto the image. So it could be something simple from running a bash script or even just copying files. In this case, we're using the Ansible local provisioner to run a playbook before we bundle the image. So you take that big bunch of JSON, you pass it to the packer build command, and it goes off and does its merry thing, the output of which looks something like this. Now, the key point to take from this is, as much as possible, packer will try and execute your builds in parallel. And this saves a huge amount of time if you're bundling it into your build tools and your pipelines. So in this example, we're building both a HVM and a power virtual AMI because that means we can support both the older instance types as well as the newer ones. As I mentioned earlier, we actually programmatically generate the template. And we need to do that because we need to inject 
certain metadata into the context of the ch root. So uh, our build tool generates a lot of environment variables, things like component version and upstream pipeline versions. But that's not available in the context of the ch root. So by using the extra vars hooks in Ansible, we can inject that into the context of the ch root. And we also pass in additional role paths. So each of our Ansible roles has its own pipeline and is independently tested, which then feeds into the image. And this is how it gets bundled in. And of course, we also want to set tags. So given all this information exists on the agent itself, the build agent, we just literally take that and inject it into the packer context. As Werner said this morning, there is a caveat with the ch root builder, and that is you cannot leave any processes running, otherwise Packer can't unmount that block device. So in our case, with Ansible roles, we actually submit upstream pull requests to make service management a flaggable feature, or we maintain our own forks and explicitly stop all services running before the Packer run finishes, so they can actually unmount and snapshot that volume. And as Werner said, again, the ch root builder, HashiCorp doesn't really typically recommend you use it because it's quite limited in its features. But I'm going to say something a little controversial and say it's actually the fastest way to build an image on Amazon. And we've been using it for nearly two years without many issues. So I think it's pretty stable. Now I'm going to take a, another moment to talk about another important feature of running an automated build infrastructure. And that is metadata. As Anne said this morning, make metadata your best friend. Because you need to rely on this. And you need to build automating tooling that can rely on this. I don't want to spin up an instance of an image to actually see what's on that image. Or to paraphrase a different way, given containers are all the hotness right now, there's a, a concept from the shipping container world. And that is the idea of a shipping manifest. And the manifest is essentially a list of all of the contents and the ownership of the contents of a container. Now, they've been doing this for 100 plus years, and it works for them. So if it works for them, it works for the context of building images. Now, in our case, our schema looks something like this. So we have the component name, the component version, uh, AMI version. The reason why AMI version is different from component version is because the way our pipelines are set up if you need to make a change to the underlying system, you don't need to rebuild and recompile an artifact. It's a separate change to the version of the, uh, the component. So that's why they're separate. And of course, the build time as well. And the important thing to take away here is the tags on the image become the tags on the auto-scaling group, and by extension, the tags on the runtime instance. And we also add additional runtime tags, like the environment and the country. But it should be a, generally a one-way process. As I mentioned before, it's all about traceability. So if I have a misbehaving instance, I can quickly look at its tags and trace all the way back from the pipeline right down to the individual commits that were made. So I can see which changes introduce those problems very quickly. So I talked a lot about managing component and software. But how do we actually manage the other part of that? And that's the, the component configuration. Now, when we first rolled out this architecture, we were running in three Amazon regions, and we had three environments per region. So that's nine possible iterations of that configuration file. So we decided to actually build all of those different versions of that configuration and put it into the same image. And then on boot, because we had consistent metadata, we had a script that would inspect that data and then decide which of those configs was the right one to use and then delete all of the others. So the way we implemented this is we had in Ansible a big vars file, essentially a hash map, keyed by country and environment. And then we used that to generate the lookup paths. And then the template, using the with items operator in Ansible, would write the different versions of that template file to disk. And this worked. It worked reasonably well. And it kind of got us to the point where we could start making tuning and improvements. But the problem we had with this approach, and the problem really the engineers had with this, is that a one-line config change required to go through the entire build pipeline, which 
at that time took over an hour. And if you were doing this many times during the day, it became quite a frustrating process. So we had to have a way to decouple that config from the image. And that brings us to console. So when we brought that console, we decided to put all that config into the console KB store. And then I have a console template agent watch for changes in its particular tree. And then when a change was made, it would rewrite the config to disk and restart the corresponding service. And it should point out that config value changes are not the same as template changes. Some of you might be thinking, this doesn't really fit with immutable architecture. What the hell are you talking about? But the way I would say this is, if you were to change a value during runtime, you're not fundamentally changing the actual template file itself. If I was to introduce a new config value, then I have to change the template. And that requires baking an entire new image. And that's a version bump. So as I mentioned before, we had nine possible iterations of that configuration. And because we were deploying it in different regions and different environments, we wanted to keep the image consistent. So regardless of where it's deployed, whether it's in the US East 1 or US West 2, the image should be the same. Otherwise, to run the risk of issues falling between the cracks. So a quick pop quiz. Hands up if you think a config value change would trigger a service outage. Some of you. So the answer is yes, it, it would. Um, for services that are written in Node.js or Go, a restart is very quick. But for services that we were running, which were running on the JVM, restarts could take 30 seconds or a minute. And because console template was watching the same tree for all these instances, when it noticed the change, the restart went at exactly the same time. And that, of course, brought the service down, which led to outages. So the solution to this is simple. Use the distributed console locks. So delegate your service restart to a script that will acquire a lock before it does a restart. And once the restart successfully completes, it releases the lock. And the rest of the agents are essentially eagerly trying to acquire a lock. And once they do it, just to basically have a rolling restart effect across the cluster to prevent service outages. It's a simple bug, but it's one that caught us out without us realizing it. And I thought it was worth sharing. So now that we've decoupled the config from the build of the image, how do you keep the config in sync? How do you assert that a config is not going to introduce a regression when you deploy new versions? So given we had this giant, fantastic hash map in Ansible, one of the problems that we frequently encountered was engineers would write over each other's changes because it's the same file. And Git is supposed to help you with that, but the reality is not everybody did a Git pull. And some naughty engineers did a Git force push. So <laughs> we decided that we needed to structure our KV data as a random interlude. Who knows what that picture, what building that picture is of? OK, for those of you with an interest in architecture, this is a picture of the award-winning Deloitte HQ in Amsterdam. Um, and it's award-winning because it is the world's most sustainable office building. Uh, humidity, temperature, and lighting are all controlled automatically. I think one of the coolest things you can do in this building is you can rock up with your iPad, go to your desk with all your unique settings, and it creates its own unique bubble for you with your unique lighting, temperature, and humidity settings. It's pretty cool. But the other cool thing about this building is it generates almost 100% of its electricity and it recycles rainwater. But during this construction, they used a lot of prefabrication techniques and had standardized designs. So lots of independent teams could work together. A bit of a tenuous link to structured KV data stores, but I thought it was exciting and thought it was worth sharing. So as I said, we structured our KV store by namespacing it based on the Amazon region and the environment level, and then broken down by version as well. So as I said, it's very easy to then reason about the config and it minimizes the chance of teams writing over each other's data. So our standardized key spaces look something like this. 
So we have a top level components key space, which then has version, country, environment, and then the actual key underneath it. And for stuff that's a bit more static, we have a global common key space, so things like ports. And then for shared config, like API keys, they are stuck in the common namespace as well. But the other thing about this is, as much as possible, I think config should be versioned just like code. So even though we've decoupled the config from the AMI, we still need to be able to version it, because then we still need to, if we need to roll back, we know that the config is in a known working good state. And that's why we wrote another service called Marco Polo. And it's written in Scala. It hooks into our continuous delivery pipelines. And it essentially orchestrates config changes through from stage to live and from live to the next stage. So let's take a look at how it works. So I have a build job from the pipeline. And the first thing it does is it sends a request to Marco Polo to say, I want version 23. So Marco Polo goes off, makes reasons about our architecture, and says, OK, version 22 is the latest version in live. So I will copy version 23 and put that as stage version 23. And the same with deploys. So when a deploy job comes along, we make the same request to Marco Polo, which then says, oh, OK, I have version 23 in stage. You want me to do a live deploy. So I'll copy what's in version 23 stage and put that to the live tree, and then it returns OK. So that architecture is actually in place right now, and it works very well for us. But then on the other side of the story, how do components know which version of the config to use, what tree to look up their values from in console? Now, what I'm about to show you is, is a bit of a dirty hack. Uh, so if you have an aversion to slightly dirty solutions, Please look away now. So what we actually do is um, we pre-render that template. So when we write the console template file to disk, we actually put placeholders into that file. And then on boot, we have a script that looks up the metadata, looks up the tags, and fills in the gaps, essentially, and then writes a console template file to disk, which then console template comes along, reads, and ultimately rewrites the, the, the correct config file for the components. So let's take a look at how it looks. So when we bake an image, this is what's in the image. So that template file has placeholders for country and environment. The version number we actually know up front because it's from the build pipeline, so we can bake that in. So when the script runs, it replaces those placeholders with their actual values, and that then becomes the complete tree to look up the value for in console. So console template can then look at that and actually then retrieve the correct values and write the file to disk. Now, I couldn't talk about immutable infrastructure if I didn't talk about state. So let's talk about state. State is hard. State's a really hard problem to solve. And without state and without users, our systems would run first time, every time, with no scalability problems, it would be a perfect world. But of course, that doesn't align with business needs. So state can be managed and encapsulated. So it's some typical things that counter state during the runtime of a component are things like logs, uh, metrics, your, your data storage, databases, even caches and DNS. And as much as possible, you have to try and defer that state external to the component and try and break things apart. So in our case, for logs, we externally collect them using Elasticsearch and Flume and Kibana. For metrics, we externally collect them using Sensu. Uh, and for DNS, obviously, that's cached externally using a separate system. But I would not try and force things into immutable infrastructure if it doesn't work. So in our case, we were using Cassandra as our data store. And because of its clustering technologies and the way it worked, it actually fit really well with auto-scaling and an immutable architecture. But I wouldn't want to do the same thing for a traditional RDBNS like MySQL, for example. Because if you're trying to externally capture that state on a, on a volume, you're sacrificing a lot of your performance. And you're kind of giving up the point of the database. So the idea here is 
you know, just be pragmatic about it. Don't try and force everything into this architecture. And the same principles apply to containers. I have these arguments numerous times with engineers who say, containerize all the things. But then containers aren't the solution for everything. I would not containerize a MySQL database. Ask me afterwards why I wouldn't do that. <laughs> I want to spend a little bit of time talking about routing as well, because surprisingly, it took us a long time and a lot of iterations to kind of get this right. Before we started rolling out immutable infrastructure, we were running the easy jet of load balancing tiers, a tool called Balance. And it was incredibly simple. It had no config files. It had no service management. It was very difficult for us to dynamically update and configure. So when we revisited our routing architecture, because our infrastructure would be replacing instances all the time, we didn't want to update localized state files. We wanted things to be automatic and hosts to be automatically discovered. And because we made the decision that every single component runs on a globally unique port, we could store that as a lookup table in a KV store. And we quickly moved away from our cheap and cheerful load balancing solution to HA proxy. So then we can use that lookup tier, that lookup KV store, to generate uh, a new set of backends for HA proxy whenever new instances are discovered. So let's take a look at how it works. So in this architecture, we have a two node active active HA proxy cluster. I'm going to call it pseudo active active because, as we know in the cloud, it doesn't support multicast. So you have to use alternative tools like Coral Sync to give you the synchronization. So when we launch a new instance, it doesn't immediately get rooted to because it needs to be discovered. So a script on HA proxy node finds all of the instances. And when it gets a new instance with that component tag, it realizes, hey, there's, there's a difference here. So it generates a new backend list and a new HA proxy config. So then when that service is reloaded, the new instance is brought into service and starts serving traffic. Now that script ran on a minute cron. And we had this HA proxy tier replicated again in three environments and three countries. So that's nine scripts making Amazon API calls every single minute. So a problem that we quite quickly encountered was the wonderful rate limiting of Amazon. So our dev architecture ended up causing rate limiting issues, which then took live out, which was amazing. So we decided to introduce some level of caching and try and reduce that. But in a, HA, in a console enabled world, we no longer have that problem because everything is registered in console. And we use service discovery. So when a new instance rolls out, uh, console automatically discovers it and regenerates a list of backends. So that's how we do things. So I've given you quite a few interesting design patterns that we've had to implement over the past few years. And hopefully, I've given you something useful to take away. But to summarize a few key points, Immutable infrastructure is very difficult to roll out at first. It can be a massive paradigm shift for your tooling or for your engineering teams to kind of think. A lot of engineers were used to just hacking away, SSHing into a box and making changes. But in the new world, that, that, that SSH access is gone unless you're incident debugging. So you have to get used to the idea that an instance will disappear and come back independently. But once you do all the hard work, it's incredibly fast to scale up and down. And that's ultimately the reason why we had to employ this architecture. And another reason and another benefit for doing this is cost saving. Now, as Vish said yesterday, when Sainsbury's moved to, a, to an auto scaling architecture, they reduced their costs by about 13%. And when we before we started rolling out this architecture, because we found it so hard to scale up and down, we were running a massively over-provisioned architecture. We were spending hundreds of thousands of dollars a month to run this architecture. That's a huge amount of money to, to waste, essentially, doing nothing. And when we rolled this out, we were actually to, able to reduce our costs by almost 70%. That's an order of magnitude saving. That's a lot of beer, a lot of whiskey 
So as Vish said, the power is in your hands. You can save that money and reinvest it in fine food and whiskey. And the other principle to take away is to be pragmatic. Immutable is actually a bit of a loose definition in the case of immutable infrastructure. Because regardless of what you do, you will need some element of bootstrapping to bring instances up and wire it up to the rest of your architecture. And immutable infrastructure ultimately serves to simplify change management. The benefit of building things this way is that you get consistent atomic deployments. And it's pretty awesome when you think about it from a build tooling point of view. And everything just becomes much easier to run because you no longer have to deal with the concept of, of bit rot, of servers running for a long time and quickly falling out of disrepair by security updates not being applied or patches not being applied. You're building a new image and replacing the server each time. So you no longer have that problem. And one of the hardest things that we had to deal with is to trust our continuous delivery tooling. I think engineers in general have a distinct aversion to build tooling. Everything needs to be done by hand. Everything needs to be done by one developer. And we had to fight hard to kind of dis change that mentality. And if your build tooling doesn't give you that sense of trust, you have to keep on iterating and keep on iterating until it works reliably. So that's everything I wanted to cover today. Thanks for listening. Uh, have you got any time for questions? Does anyone have any questions? Yeah. Um, you mentioned earlier that you uh, pre-generate Pucker template for uh, building stuff. Uh, what's exactly the use case for that? Uh, so the question was, what do we exactly use to generate? Well, like, uh, what's the use case? I, I, we, we do use Parker, but we basically put in the, our PaaS repo, and we already have all the information that we need in the template. So why did you need to, what was the use case to have that generated kind of a runtime sort of thing? Right. So the reason why we had to generate a packet template is, as I alluded to, in our build pipelines, because we were using the Amazon CH root builder, that is not going to have access to all of our environment variables on the build host and additional other metadata stores that are external to the build pipelines. So we basically needed to get that data from two different locations and then stick that together into one pipeline, uh, into one template. And that's why we had to do that programmatically. So then we can feed that into the context of the CH root. It has all the information it needs and then our packer, uh, sorry, our Ansible playbooks then use that information. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does, but yeah, you, you could have probably just injected it in like just in Ansible as a variables or group files and things rather than do packer. But. Yeah, but because our architecture is so dynamic, uh, the inventory was constantly changing, mm -hmm. so it's a bit hard to keep that kind of state up to sync. And I know you can look it up dynamically, but we chose to just pre-generate the packet template so it keeps things a lot simpler. Yeah. Um, one, one more. When you mention like, configuration versioning, what has been your take on, on that topic? How, how do you do it? Uh, like, like, do you use, like, do you version it with Git or do you use like, uh, additional tools? All oh, right. So how do we actually version the config? Yeah. Right. So the version numbers come out of our build pipeline uh, because console KV is just a big hash map. Uh, and of course, yes, you can back that up into a JSON file and stick that into an S3 bucket. But we actually needed to be able to say exactly what version of a config was available for a given component. And it's hard to reason about that across an entire hash map. We needed to be specific in this particular tree of the KV store. So that's why our build pipeline numbers feed into the KV tree structure. And then the components use that to look up the version based on their own AMI tags. Uh, how did you ensure like, the security of sensitive data in the config if you have any like third-party services key and things like that? So the question there was how do we, uh, how do we manage secure secrets? Um, there's an interesting talk going on at the same time that's 
to answer that question. Uh, we do use Vault. Uh, we haven't yet wired it up to console, um, but we are working on a solution to help us manage that. Right now, we use Vault for securing your engineer access to our architecture using the Amazon IAM backend. So we get limited time leases that engineers can then use to SSH in. OK, thanks. Any more questions? You created some great slides. I want to ask if you make them available online somewhere. Uh, I think the slides will be available after the talk, yeah. I'll make, them, I'll make sure they're available online. Thanks, Thank you.